So ladies and gentlemen, we're the only thing that stands between you and uh, lunch. And we're going to talk about um, appetites for risk. And um, hopefully we'll build up your own appetite for your lunch. But um, I think it should be a pretty interesting uh, discussion. I'm absolutely delighted with the quality of the panel. We have some very illustrious individuals in front of you now. Um, and it's quite a great mix of expertise. So I think I'm just going to go through the panel first and give you a little bit of background why I say it's such a great mix. First of all, we have Simon Foster, who represents a single family office. We have John Veal, who represents a Stonehenge Fleming Partners, which uh, manages, uh, looks after over 250 families, if I'm not mistaken. And we have Yarev, uh, who has a bit of a hybrid bread operation, insofar as there's one principal family behind this asset management group that only looks after the assets of a handful of other families. So I think it's quite a diverse um, mix, and I think we should have a pretty interesting discussion. We certainly did when we had our, our telephone call a couple of weeks ago. So um, I think if we begin first by asking um, each of the panelists, and we'll start with Simon, uh, to give one or two sentences only, just about your own investment philosophy, and then we'll drill down there. So what is your approach to investment? And Thanks, Marta. Um, good afternoon, I'm Simon Foster. I'm CFO of Team White and Junior Family Office. Um, I think today we're talking about risk within the portfolio. Um, I think from my perspective, the way we approach risk is, I look at it that we're a knowledge-based investor. I think all family offices are unique. It's been my pleasure to be CFO of three of them, and I think all of them have worked completely differently from each other in terms of appetite, investment structure, and vehicle structure. So I think one of our key planks of approach is understanding what we are. We're a unique vehicle, we represent a prominent African family, and we're based in Surrey, so I don't think there are too many other vehicles which are identical to us. <laughs> so we look at the world through that lens. Um, whilst a fairly robust family office of about 10 people, we only ever invest in spaces that we think we understand. We're ultra direct, um, we like to be close to the money, we do our own due diligence, most of our direct assets are on our balance sheet, things like property, and private equity. We also act as a captive fund manager for the family. So we think we approach it in a highly direct approach, understanding who we are and you know, where we're putting the money to work. John. Thank you. Uh, John Veal, uh, CIO of the Stone Investment Partners, we're part of the Stone Fleming Group today, and uh, the broadest, broadest set of um, approaches. What, what I want to make up from your question about the philosophy. We work with a multitude of families and, and at the core of our philosophy, something that's very important to set up um, is to understand the risks for each individual family, or rather help the families understand what risks they already have, what risks they're willing to take, and what risks they will be comfortable with to stay through the course. Um, uh, Greg earlier on one of his slides brought up the point that many investors out there have experienced something worse than an investment than the average out in the industry because people tend to chase the market, they tend to chase the people who turn well, um, and they unfortunately also tend to, when they haven't got the call right, pull other things at exactly the one time in the body. A large part of our focus is helping families identify the types of risks that they will be comfortable to take and when those risks actually do manifest, because we hope they don't manifest, make sure that they um, are able to work in a proactive way to avoid damaging, actually losing money over the long term in their portfolios. Risk as measured by month on month volatility. It's a useful tool for us, but that is not the risk of families that we work with. The risk to our families is either losing money absolutely because something goes completely wrong, or losing money because you've timed it along across the cycle. Of course, another end of the spectrum for the risk is being too safe, too cautious, and leaving opportunity on the table over the long term. Okay. Yeah. Yara, yes. a little bit about the background of Sparrow's Capital, mm -hmm. and then what your investment philosophy is, first of all. Uh, 
and try and not time it, because we, we would argue no one can time mark it, but we try to make uh, our clients comfortable with the risk they're bearing while taking their exposure into the long term, and then to just be very disciplined with their asset allocation and with the way they implement uh, the um, execution part of running their portfolio. I think that's a very valid point that you've made. In my days of being a private banker, it seemed to me that one of my key objectives was to constantly be applying or be acting as a reality check for clients to say, explain again what your expectations are. Let me try and put that into the context of what is actually realistic. And I think that's a really important point that you've set up. And I, I kind of agree with that though because I mean, one of the, the things that's coming up, coming up in this panel is about optimization. But the question I always come back to is, what do you actually mean by optimization? You know, I mean, Barry Steph, our portfolio manager who's over there, she knew I was going to do that. But when we talk about the target for our fund, you know, which is our liquid market fund, we target LIBOR plus 200 basis points here. Yeah? And every time I meet a Manhattan hedge fund manager, they talk about, yeah, we made 50% last year. We go, that's great, thanks, bye, but not for us, yeah. And I think what, what I would find so interesting about the family office world is what do you mean by optimization? So for us, we very much live in a world where it's low target, yeah. If we can make LIBOR plus 200 basis points year in, year out, that the patriarch of the family is happy. And if we actually make 15%, we'd probably get fired. So it's, you know, I think what I find so fascinating is, you know, how you define optimize for us, it's you know, ultimate long term wealth protection. Would you agree with that definition? Completely. Uh, we, we're not trying to create new wealth, so we're trying to make sure that the wealth is sustained at a real point for the long term. And that, that is not achieved by. I think that brings us rather it. neatly to the question, which I think you're beginning to answer already. How do you avoid succumbing to the herd mentality? bit that you just touched on. Well, well, kind of. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I kind of said it at the beginning, we're, we're a knowledge-based investor. You know, we work for an African family. We're a family office of about 10 people out of Nisha. So that's big by family office standards. But, you know, compared to some of the big investment firms, we don't have the bench strength to be in, in every asset class or every equity. So what we do is we, we invest what we know. You know, when it comes to property investing, we invest in three geographies. We invest in neighborhoods that we understand from a street level. And we invest in the neighborhood where, where the family office is. So we gravitate towards investing in areas that we think we understand at a, at a fundamental level. Somebody asked me the other day, don't you leave money on the table? And I, yeah, I think we probably do, but by the same token, you know, our goal isn't to punch the lights out, it's to invest in a very, very disciplined, a very long-term manner. Um, in a manner that supports you know, the preservation of wealth across multiple generations. And our goals really aren't about ultimate return that it's, that it's for its own sake. But also, I mean, you can afford to leave money on the table, if I understand correctly, yeah. the background of the family that um, your pa patriarch still has is generating cash. So for you, is it part of the challenge that you're getting additional asset flow into the family office structure yeah. that you are subsequently putting out to work. Well, well that, that's, that's an interesting point. I mean, because I, I often debate internally whether we're a top-down strategic asset allocator investor or we're a ground-up knowledge investor. And I think I've, I've reached a hybrid solution in my mind in that I think it depends on asset class, you know. And we talked about, you know, risk and return. But I think for an entity like us, in some ways, it's very, very hard to have a global view around that, you know, because I think, you know, we're quite cohesive when it comes to the liquid assets, we come to the property assets and those kind of things, but I think we can get a little punchy when it comes to things like the private equity assets and some of the families investing in particularly in industrial concerns in Africa. You know, different courses for different courses. Just a quick point on that. Um, if I understand correctly, Simon, you don't co-invest, it's all... Well, I mean, that's, that's interesting. We, strangely, this is my third family office, not quite sure how that happened. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of co-investing for family offices in the right environment, um, but for me, it, it, has, it has to be the right environment. And I think a common theme for me, really, is with the three family offices I've been involved in, there's lots of industrial concerns. I think co-investing has its place, but for me, I've tended to gravitate towards co-investing being done by portfolio companies, rather than co-investing being done by the family office. And the reason is, you know, for me, I mean, you know, one of the, my first family office were heavy in the automotive. 
And what I liked about that meant that we had automotive expertise within the portfolio company. So if a co-investor deal was coming on, we'd gravitate to using a strategy like asking the executive management team of the auto company to go and have a look at it. They're better placed than perhaps I would be as, as CFO of, of the family office. Here, let's go back to the original question I just asked a few minutes ago. How do you avoid succumbing to the herd mentality? Uh, I think this is a very important question because um, quite frankly, one of the biggest um, impacts that any portfolio would have is due to uh, psychological effects, uh, financial uh, behavior of finance. And we will find that um, when, when you know, things become very rosy, then people start hurting. And when things get gloomy, then you know, people start feeling fearful. And we have been investing in a very passive manner for the past almost seven years now. So we went through the cycle, the latest cycle, and we saw exactly to what extent that may, uh, may lead us. So the, the important thing here is, one, um, to be very disciplined. If you cannot sustain discipline, then all strategic planning you have in place will become very, very tactical in a very quick manner. And trying to become tactical bears a lot of risks. Risks of timing markets and risks on, you know, losing control of your asset allocation. So that is number one. The number two factor here is to again um, educate your investors. Make sure they are knowledgeable. I remember um, having a discussion after the financial crisis. I think it was roughly 2012, with one of the investors um, I work with. And he came to me having seen what the discipline approach and, and systematic rebalancing did to his portfolio. And he came to me with a great insight. He told me, I'm actually protecting him from himself. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, uh, you know, I, I don't suspect a lot of investors to come to you and say that in the manner he did with me. But it is to some extent true. Uh, investors succumb to the psychological biases, and unless we can implement a discipline approach which uh, favors long term, um, we will, you know, we will succumb to the same uh, issues as they do. I think it's a really good point. John, do you want to add anything on this business about herd mentality? I, I'll just. Uh, nodding away there in terms of protecting our funds. I, I think often people look at us, to, to your point, um, clients sometimes will look to us to expect them to tell them what we expect the markets to do. And I completely agree. In the short term, we do not think that we have got any sort of edge in calling the markets and adding value. And, and I see our job often as being um, maybe with a different approach to just a pure, pure rebalance approach is to tell people when they're getting too excited about things that it's time to get less excited, just dump them out into those areas, and when they get too pessimistic and too despondent, just tell them it's actually time to do something, something different. So, um, I really actually don't have much to, to add to no, that in, in terms of philosophy. Um, the the, the, the concept of herd mentality, we've seen in the past couple of decades some areas of really major, um, real proper, proper bubble behaviour. Uh, the, the late, or the early 2000s, the TNT period when they sold off the um, Today, today we're not seeing that, that passionate excitement into a specific area and we don't, we're not identifying any sort of broad investor period of excitement. But the, the one area that, that we do continually remind our clients and ourselves to be aware of is that an environment where yields and uh, yields across asset classes have been uh, suppressed quite tremendously in the past few years is that it is important that you stick to the level of risk that is appropriate for yourself and not to target returns by moving up and up in the spectrum in a period like this. We don't know for how long that period might last or might not last. But our key job here is to help people step the right level of risk and manage the risk appropriately 
so that we don't end up in those situations. One last question, and then I'll open up um, the discussion to the floor. Um, what are your views about, we, we had this chat when we spoke together, views about outsourcing risk management to third parties? I know you all feel pretty strongly about this, so <laughs> this will be interesting. Um, Yark, do you want to kick off? Um, sure. Um, I think that there are certain things that all investors, uh, and it doesn't matter if they have consultants or family offices or asset managers like ourselves, there are certain things that they cannot outsource. They Such simply as? Can't. And I think two main things here which I would emphasize right now is one is the, the risk management. Only they can uh, help build their risk profile and their risk appetite. And one needs to be very cautious with having a third party defining a risk profile for oneself. And the other thing, by the way, I would mention is ownership. Um, I would suggest investors not to third party the ownership part of their wealth. I think long gone the days of people coming to investors and telling them, you should put your money with us and don't worry about it, come back in five years, we'll give you exceptional returns. I think uh, these days are over and I think investors should be much more cautious these days with turning ownership over their wealth. Now, after all, they've, some of them either inherited or some of them even worked very hard to build their wealth. So that I wouldn't recommend them to depart with it. Um, in terms of outsourcing and doing it yourself, I, I, I think it's really important that before you even put some that point is, is, is making sure that you need to know what your risks are clearly. Uh, a sophisticated system that, that runs through the underlying security across your whole portfolio and provides a whole load of data on the statistics and maybe your volatility numbers up to now might be a useful tool, but at the end of the day you really need to know what are the key things that are going to drive your portfolio in scenarios, which I refer to in the scenarios that you might expect, but importantly in the scenarios that you might be worried about, scenarios you don't expect. Um, for us, that means that we need to keep that in-house, we need to be doing the work ourselves, we need to know not, not just our allocations across asset classes, currencies, and liquidity, but also um, the, the, res the, the response of our portfolios to certain factors that, that we think are important or major on our portfolios, and importantly, the response that our portfolios might have to factors if events change. And you, to, to do that, you need to, you need to be in a situation where you, you can see the woods. If you've got too much data, too, much, too, too fancy a system, and you, and you just rely on the system, you're in danger of just looking at the trees. You, you need to be able to simplify it, um, look, look back at it, and really understand, understand the risks that you're taking. And, and to do that, it's important that you do it. For us, it's important that you do it ourselves, or do it in house, so that, that you, you can you can read through that data and see, as I say, see the ones from the trees. Simon, do you want to add anything? Sure, absolutely. Um, this is an area we're very passionate about. I mean, if any of you have come across us before, you probably know that we're ultra passionate about insourcing. And I think one of my points around this would be, um, again, where a London family office representing a Nigerian family with extensive oil and gas exposure. We have property assets in California, Singapore, and London. We're very, very different to most other people's family offices. The family offices I know are all different from each other. I think my biggest problem with outsourcing is this. It implies the ability to use a generic model to meet your needs. And for most of the people I've interacted with, they've been so weird and wonderful that generic models just don't apply. So for me, I'm very, very adamant about insourcing risk. If I can have one other comment on that as well, through my career I've also acted for a large number of family members in various environments. And in a lot of environments I've managed to get my hands on their mandates with some of the private banks they interact with. And what's been interesting about that for me is I've never seen anybody with a risk profile as defined by a private bank as being anything below moderate despite most of the people I know telling me that their goals are preservation of wealth. So I think my experience with the private banks has been, well, if their goals are preservation, yet their risk profile has been assigned as moderate, my biggest question is why. 
And the answer to my mind is in most of those environments, up the further you are the risk profile, the more juicy your profile is, the more trading you do, and the more That's money that your trade counterparty makes out of it. So one of my biggest doubts about outsourcing on it is what kind of profile are you going to get? Is it going to be good for me, or is it going to be good for the outsourcer? And experience has led me to believe, unfortunately, it's quite often the latter. Yeah, I can add to that one. Um, when I was still a private banker, rather as I was exiting private banker, I was dealing with um, a lady client who was not at all sophisticated. And I was really terrified about how she would be looked after once I left the bank. So I went, pulled up her risk profile, the investment parameters, and I said, Isabel, we're going to make you uber conservative. I said, as long as we put this in place, in writing, and I set the asset allocation based on a very conservative approach, you should be all right. Are we clear? She said, yes, yes, we're clear. I leave banking, the crisis happens, and I get a panicked phone call at home. In tears, same lady. And I said, well, how is it possible? I said, you know, I left you in very good nick 18 months ago. You know, there's, there's no way. And I, there's a dramatic pause, and I said, don't tell me you let them change your risk appetite portfolio. She said, yes. I was moved from conservative to moderate. <laughs> exactly what she said. And I said, that was the time you should have picked up the phone to me because I could have stepped in then. But the reality is, if the portfolio management is in line with what you allowed yourself to be talked into, my hands are tied. So I think that was an excellent point to make. Now, we only have a few more minutes, but I'm sure you're all burning with questions, particularly because you have such a great panel. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't know your name. Could you tell us who you are? Sorry, yeah, thanks. I am a finance I'm sorry, could we have the voice? Hi, my name is Imad Fatala from IMF Finance. Um, the question to all the panel, I've heard like uh, capital optimization, uh, aggressively passive, capital preservation, my question really to all of you is to see if you've had any experience with capital guaranteed products over the years. And really what has been that experience of yours? Because it sounds like when these products started, a lot of people were going into them uh, on the basis of these three words that I've heard earlier. Uh, but uh, definitely experience really experience what you've experienced over the years it would be something uh, if it's possible to share with us. I think it's um, cap capital guaranteed products uh, are a great place for us to, to come into the picture with families. And for us, the, the, the concept of capital guaranteed product I'm afraid there's no guarantees on anything in life. Um, so, so what we always have to do, if, we, if we're going to look at anything like this, and, and, and we, we're not great users of, of, of the, the space, how is that capital guarantee provided? Who is providing the capital guarantee? How much are you paying for the guarantees that are being built into the system? And importantly, what is the capital guarantee product trying to provide? Do you actually want exposure to what it's trying to provide? Uh, all of these, all of these components are things that need to be uh, thought about, understood, and decided upon. A capital guarantee product is wrapped up in a structured loan, and effectively, would be, uh, historically, would have been a, a zero coupon bond combined with a call option on yep. on some underlying time. But there are obviously much more sophisticated components to this. Um, who wrote, the hundred, who wrote the zero coupon bond? Would you be happy to have the exposure to that counterparty in your portfolio? How much exposure do you, do you have to that counterparty in your portfolio if you are happy to have them? Um, the call option itself is written on some idea or theme out there that you want. Did you really want exposure to that space? Importantly, 
how much you pay for the optionality on it is it, is it right, right to take it. Um, so in, in terms of have we used these, what do we think? But typically for, for many, many situations that we see, you actually don't need to go and buy a wrapped product to do this. If we want exposure to a space, it might be much more efficient to have our standard portfolio. And if you do feel comfortable taking a direct exposure through a call option, taking that call option yourself and not paying fees to anyone else to provide that exposure. Do you want to add yeah, I mean, again, that is something, something I would love to add on. Um, again, structured products are an area we're extremely passionate about. Um, my view is this, is we, we don't touch structured products. We wouldn't touch structured products with a barge pole. Um, the reason we wouldn't touch structured products with a barge pole, or anything vaguely like them, is we don't buy bundles of assets. Because the problem with bundles of assets is somebody else put them together. Um, we have seen examples as well. I mean, I, I hate to say this, but it's... You know, I nearly did a math degree at some point, but half the structured products we see, I don't understand. Let alone some of the other people we interact with who are being sold them. I think, you know, I think they're, they're a blip in the market. And, you know, as was just said, I don't, if I want a bundle of assets, I can go and buy a bundle of assets. Why would I need to wrap them in a note with concern about the trade counterparty? So we're very, very passionate about them not being, being a good fit, certainly for us or most family offices. I would really agree with that wholeheartedly. Let the record show, in all of my years of private banking, I did not sell a single structured product. I never thought they were in the client interest, ever. It was another way for the bank to capture value for the bank's benefit and not for the client benefit. I think the minute somebody talks to you about guaranteed returns, run a mile. Another question, Michael. Excellent panel. Uh, in periods of uncertainty and, um, shall we say, fluctuating paper currencies and government bonds with negative yields, do you see a place now or increased place now for precious metals and another sadly unloved liquid asset, much loved by myself, maturing casks of whiskey? <laughs> Well, I would probably be the least appropriate person to address that question because, um, quite frankly, um, every time people wish me to uh, tell them what will happen, um, I say, I don't know. <laughs> I just really don't know what will happen. And, and I would argue, by the way, that the vast majority of us has no clue what will happen tomorrow. So the only certain thing we should expect is the uncertainty you were referring to. Uh, things will happen unexpectedly. That's granted. Um, if you think that uh, you have a view, then prepare to be surprised. And um, that's why I think that it's really hard for me to address any, um, any questions that uh, go to more of crystal bowling gazing or uh, in that area. So, sorry to disappoint. John? Um, I, you could probably spend hours here talking about what would drive the gold price up or what could drive the gold price down. Um, trying to predict where commodity prices are going to go. Any commodity price, which is not a yearly asset economy compared to us, I think is an incredibly difficult thing to do and we don't believe we're going to have an edge on it. Um, we, we, we will deal with many families. You can imagine we often get asked that question. Some people take a, a significant amount of comfort in having a diverse set of exposures which might include precious metals or gold in their portfolios. And, and the approach we take is, is not to pretend that we can predict where things can go. We, we can see where the sentiment is excessively high on areas, unlike, uh, say, the gold price a couple of years ago. In which case, as I said earlier, we try and discourage people getting too excited. And there will come times when people are excessively pessimistic, in which case you'll say it's maybe not the time to sell things. Um, but but we, we, this is not something that we would um, use as a major, major tool. The gold, gold pool of gold and gold is a very small asset pool compared to our financial markets today, so it can be driven tremendously uh, by, by investor sentiment. So I, I wouldn't 
It wouldn't be one that I would want to bet against. But it's also I think it's going to be a, a major component of our portfolios. On the whiskey front, I, I suspect as, as, as long as you enjoy drinking it, <laughs> um, fantastic. You might as well put it aside and it might do well, but uh, I, I don't really have a view on the prices going forward. So. A quick addendum? Well, Michael, there's no downside risk because you can always drink it. There's yeah. a problem. No, but I mean, as, as a gentleman have said, I, I still understand how the market is where it is now. You know, we've been at interest rates for about 400 years low for about six years. Um, what's all over today? I mean, is it back over 50 again? How did that get there? So I think one of the themes is as well, don't know how we got here, don't know where we're going. So I think our, a lot of our asset allocations are about, well, for, let's build something that's going to be robust no matter what happens. Um, for us, we've included in that so esoteric things, like we've got a large contemporary art collection. That's been our best performing asset class. Not quite sure how we got there either. But um, and it's made one of the family members very happy. Made one of the family members very, very happy. But you know, strange things fit well. So I mean I can see a case for things like whiskey. My only comment on it would be as long as you understand whiskey. Um, I love whiskey, I love trying to understand whiskey, be a good path anyway. So for me, sure. As long as it's a balanced approach to doing it, then I think I can see a case for a fit for lots of these esoteric asset classes in the portfolio. Well, sadly to say, we're not being offered whiskey at lunch, at least not as far as I know. But I do think it is probably the moment for us to draw this discussion to a close. And I want to thank my illustrious panel. I really enjoyed this, and I hope you have too.